Welcome everyone uh, to this online seminar on the 2021 parliamentary elections in Russia as a window into Russian politics. My name is Helge Blokizu. I'm a senior researcher with the research group on Russia, Asia and international trade here at the Norwegian Institute of International Affairs. And it's my great pleasure to, to chair uh, this morning's uh, event here at NUPI and here at Teams. Last weekend, Russian voters went to the polls and, as you know, uh, United Russia, which, according to most pollsters, have struggled lately, once again ended up with a supermajority in the state Duma. At the same time, the elections took place in an atmosphere of rising repressions against political activists in Russia. And against this backdrop, we ask, can elections still play a role in the legitimation strategy of the regime when the popular choice is so limited and the repressions so obvious? And to answer this question and to delve deeper into the implications of the recent elections, we have invited one of the leading experts on contemporary Russian politics, Professor Gulnaz Sharafudinova from King's College London, to share some of her insights. But before we proceed, some background information. First, this part is part of a seminar series related to a Research Council in Norway funded project on value-based regime legitimation in Russia, or legit Russia, as we call it, coordinated by Professor Paul Kolster at the University of Oslo. Um, and Gulnas is one of the international partners uh, cooperating uh, with us in, in this project. And uh, for those of you who are interested in learning more about the project, I will uh, post uh, the, a link to the web page of the project uh, in the chat. Second, after the, when, after the event, we will, as uh, always with public events at NUPI, publish the stream at NUPI's YouTube channel. So if you want to go back and and uh, listen once more to what Gunas had to say. You can uh, check in with uh, Nupi's YouTube channel in a couple of days, then the, the stream will be published. And finally, some practicalities. Uh, Gunas will speak for some 30, 35 minutes, and then we will have a Q&A session. And we'll try to wrap up, or we will wrap up at 12.30 at the latest. So please do start sending in your questions uh, via the live event uh, Q&A already now. The, the earlier you send your uh, questions, the, gre the greater is the chance that we'll get to, to answer it. But then, without further ado, uh, it's my great pleasure to give the floor, or rather the, the screen, to, to Gunnas. Please, Gunnas. Yes, thank you very much, Helke. Yes, um, Good morning, good afternoon, whoever watches it at whatever time uh, of the day. Uh, so, yes, Russia went through three days elections, um, parliamentary elections um, uh, in uh, uh, over the past uh, uh, weekend. And um, I guess the um, one of the goals for my conversation today and, you know, do keep me uh, responsible for answering this question is how can we, what can we learn about Russian politics and um, uh, its evolution over the past years through uh, the electoral process. So can we look at elections as a window, however small, into the political situation in Russia? After all, uh, elections, um, if we talk in terms of um, uh, the legitimation of Russian mm -hmm regime, elections have been uh, maintained as an important part of um, maintaining legitimacy of the system. And uh, over this past weekend, um, we can observe the results and the processes surrounding four levels of elections. Elections into the state Duma, uh, elections uh, of regional governors, not all, but in selected regions, specifically in 11 regions. Uh, elections of regional uh, parliaments, uh, regional legislative elections in 39 regions of Russia, and also uh, municipal level elections in uh, several of the regions. So uh, we've just uh, 
rather short amount of time uh, having passed, I will be focusing mostly on the state Duma elections for now. And those are, I think, central, uh, um, centrally important um, at the moment. And also may, uh, Kremlin's attention was very much glued on uh, the state Duma elections. But I will also mention uh, the results of uh, gubernatorial elections and um, maybe some um, observations about uh, regional elections or selected regional uh, elections into the uh, legislators. So when uh, we uh, just let me give uh, just few facts so that we come from the same basis. Um, state, uh, there were 450 seats uh, in State Duma in Russia and the elections combine uh, party lists with uh, single member districts. So half of these seats are elected according to proportional representation and half of them are elected um, according to um, uh, sim single member districts. So 400 se 450 seats were uh, on the offering. Um, I think when we, you know, it's uh, there might be um, uh, an enticement in looking immediately at um, the tables with results and who won, who lost, etc. But I do want to bring your attention to the run up to the elections and to the overall political context. I don't think we can make uh, any sense of numbers without understanding what has been going on, what is the overall social and political and economic environment in Russia. So. Um, I've also noticed uh, observers frequently compare uh, 2021 elections to 2016 elections and once again without highlighting the role of context we cannot understand how similar uh, the results could be expected. Um, as far as I'm concerned I would actually make a point that uh, the um, expectation of similarity with 2016 is not quite appropriate given quite dramatic changes when we look at um, the Russian landscape, a social political landscape in 2016 and in 2021. So when we look at the run up and at the um, context, we can uh, probably uh, number first uh, observation is that the post Crimea euphoria in Russia uh, has been long gone. So for a few years after 2014, we observed a rather upbeat mood among the Russian um, voters uh, that very much propped um, the regime, very much propped uh, elections and electoral processes at various levels. Uh, this mood started to evaporate already in 2018 uh, with the pension reform, but uh, then we had the pandemic, the health crisis hit uh, and exacerbate um, the economic stagnation that Russia has been in since 2013-2014. Uh, so, uh, economy has been declining, social conditions have been declining. There were only a few quarters in 2018 when the economy uh, was rising in Russia. So, uh, and with the uh, pandemic in 2020, again, the numbers have stumbled. And then, uh, so socially and economically, situation has been worsening um, gradually, but quite um, regularly over the past um, now uh, seven years. Uh, then in 2020 constitutional amendments were another uh, revelation of uh, authorities um, uh, really thinking about uh, power issues and power transition or power maintenance rather than anything else. So all these developments uh, work to overturn the sense of well-being that might have worked after 2014. So in 2016, when we talk about elections, there was still this sense of, uh, you know, certain um, optimism, certain faith in the future, certain sense of well-being that was in the record levels in 2014, but in 2016 I did focus groups uh, interviews in Russia and that sense was still there. So when we come to 2021, uh, the situation with uh, lost hopes, lost popularity of the United Russia, lost faith in authorities is quite dramatic. And the Kremlin, I think, was very much aware of uh, 
the, the fact that something needs to be done and that the government needs um, a rather different types of strategies to 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 respond to to these um, uh, depressed modes. And if I can point out, uh, uh, there are of course more than two or three strategies, but there are three that come to mind in relation to the elections and to the controlling uh, the overall political situation. One is we see a very clear pre-electoral response to the social uh, social issues. So the social agenda and anti-poverty agenda have been very much at the center of the Kremlin's rhetoric starting at least in January 2020. And more recently, over the summer of 2021, um, uh, looking over uh, Putin's press conference uh, in uh, July, uh, we saw the issue of rising prices both coming in uh, the communication with the authorities, but also uh, um, being responded to by the government. Um, so I was observing um, sort of regular, uh, regularly instituted additional social payments. Uh, we see a rather uh, uh, important support uh, coming from the Russian government to families with kids, so kids related social payments. And of course, just few weeks before elections, we saw uh, sort of chunks of social payments to pensioners, which is a big uh, voting block, uh, voting group in, in the Russian electorate, and also to the military. So the, there, uh, the social agenda has been responded to through these uh, really uh, material means and payments just to give maybe some sense of support and uh, Kremlin's reaction to the um, social desperation in the society. Now, that's the uh, when we talk about the social agenda. On the other hand, we see also um, the growing role of repression and coercive action uh, that was reflected not only in laws, but actually in the growing amount of actions against independent media sources, independent um, uh, activists, political activists, many of them uh, were sentenced, many of them uh, ran away, sort of we see an exodus of people associated with Navalny, Sobol left, um, Dmitry Gutkov um, uh, left, and so uh, that's uh, when we talk about the more active minority uh, political, uh, politically active individuals, um, uh, we see a very strong trend towards uh, growing repression and we can call it politics of fear for not allowing people on the streets and for not uh, allowing uh, uh, such activism to occur. And uh, even closer to elections, when we uh, a look at uh, which candidates were allowed to run. It also, of course, uh, uh, is important to note that any clear opposition candidates uh, were actually not allowed to run. So the whole development of um, uh, lists of candidates uh, for these elections went through a lot of managerial processes um, of regional and um, uh, federal government. Um, so the, the lists of candidates who were uh, allowed to run were cleared through authorities. So we are talking about highly managed elections. People like very popular politicians like Lev Schlossberg or Yulia Galyamina who are associated with activism. Uh, Schlossberg um, became famous after, uh, you know, from Pskov events uh, after 2014 uh, with his act activities um, and um, uh, transparent discussion of uh, sort of post-Crimea uh, issues. So they were not allowed to run uh, in, in these elections. So um, uh, in terms of candidates, we got only those that went through that um, filters. And maybe one last point about um, the government side of managing, managing and preparing for elections uh, is um, institutional creativity. Despite the fact that the opposition was not allowed to run, the Kremlin very much understood the, the demand for, for something new. Uh, the demand for some alternative um, uh, for people to vote for and uh, a new people uh, party was organized in spring 2020 uh, without a very clear ideological agenda but uh, 
uh, most uh, observers do associate it with the center right liberal agenda, sort of sort of like a competitor for a Yablok of, of sorts. But um, the individuals associated with uh, new people are not necessarily very ideological from that perspective. So there was an institutional new institutional choice available for the voters and uh, uh, as far as I'm as far as I could see this was a, again highly managed institutional creation that went into the creation of this party. Uh, the early polls showed support for United Russia around 28-29%. So uh, this was quite a dismal number. Um, I don't think the Kremlin found any viable ways of really building that support, building up that support or renewing the party. I think the social payments that were linked directly to United Russia because Putin in his um, suggestion, he suggested that the United Russia as a, a parliamentary majority should decide for these additional uh, social payments. I think that was one very immediate link that was um, designed to support, uh, to increase support for United Russia. But the early polls showed that the protest vote was going uh, a lot towards the communist and the communist party was um, very much, uh, very close in the early polls um, to the uh, United Russia polling. Now, in the run-up to elections, we saw a preparations in the opposition camp and uh, the opposition camp after Navalny's return and imprisonment very much, of course, uh, uh, is around um, uh, the team of Alexei Navalny. And here we see uh, quite a divergent divergence in expectation. There, there was a very active and politically motivated minority that um, agitated and hoped for smart voting and called for smart voting. Basically, uh, this uh, collective strategy to counter the monopoly of power by the Kremlin and coordinate the voting results and the voting of um, anti-Kremlin voters. So the idea of smart voting was that we coordinate who we vote for. Uh, it's not, um, it's, it's, uh, we see this as a development of strategy from 2011 elections where um, Navalny called for voting for anyone but the United Russia. Now, um, an alternative list of candidates was created uh, uh, for whom the anti-Kremlin voters uh, were expected to vote and were called to vote. This caused a lot of disagreements. We can uh, talk about this later because not everyone um, uh, liked the idea of voting for a uh, very uh, conservative rightist uh, communist who might be supporting Stalin, who might be ideologically very much opposed to individuals who supported smart voting. So uh, some uh, liberals did not support smart voting and this caused a lot of um, uh, uh, heated discussions in the days prior to the elections. So um, let's look now at the numbers, what we uh, what we in the end um, uh, uh, received, uh, uh, what the State Duma received, of course. So let me share, uh, let me try to share the State Duma election results screen. So give me a second. Um, mm -hmm. So if I... Just, so there... Um, there are, there are um, I'm trying to figure out, there are three windows that are open and right here. Um, so you should be now looking at the table, the State Duma election results. Um, I don't know if uh, if you see it in a... We do. Oh, yes. that's great. Um, let me, I'm increasing it on my screen. Um, well, no, number one of the, so the results you see here uh, include the the first, uh, well, the first column of the parties that got into the new Duma. Um, uh, and uh, there is a breakup uh, uh, according to the party list and the single member district um, uh, districts. And uh, I also included for comparison point um, to see the, uh, the trend. Uh, the information in the parentheses are the numbers that correspond to the 2016 elections here. Yeah? So uh, 
number one, the, uh, the party of power, United Russia, uh, the the latest results, um, uh, Helga noted a uh, supermajority, 72% uh, of uh, the total seats, um, 324 seats, uh, will be in the hands of United Russia. From the perspective of the Kremlin, uh, this is uh, undoubtedly a victory. This is a goal achieved uh, by the presidential administration. Um, so to say, despite all the odds of the political situation, the managerial um, uh, approach uh, combined with uh, a lot of um, uh, irregularities at various levels uh, uh, did bring the results to where the Kremlin wanted it. Um, we do see the trend towards uh, United Russia losing, uh, you know, uh, some numbers, right? From 76% of dominance, it has 72% of dominance. But I think that um, those uh, small nuances is not really considered to be a matter of principle. I think uh, the supermajority that the Kremlin wanted to achieve, it did achieve. Um, and uh, the irregularities and how they were able to do that, I think I started that story, but that's not yet, of course, a, a complete story because we didn't talk about uh, the process itself and all the discussions that have ensued uh, after uh, after the elections. Now, uh, the biggest um, competitor this time for the United Russia, the competitor that um, combined protest vote with the smart voting strategy are the Communist Party. Uh, and if we have um, the losers to speak about who can raise a claim of having their votes stolen, I think the Communist Party is it this time. Um, now, the Liberal Democratic Party of Russia, LDPR, uh, which uh, frequently went uh, uh, sort of um, side by side with the communists, this time actually saw uh, drops, uh, a real drop in um, numbers. Um, so we have about 7.55%, um, uh, uh, which, uh, which is what, 19 seats. Uh, in the Duma um, that uh, LDPR has. Um, Just Russia, uh, also um, there is uh, a bit drop we see with Just Russia. And uh, one big difference, we can discuss whether it's a matter of principle or not, but it seems that uh, there is a confirmation to the fact that the Kremlin did feel the necessity for an alternative and for a liberal alternative that would replace sort of Yabloka in the minds of uh, the electorate, is the entry of the new party, new people, into Duma. Uh, for up until the very last moments of um, the electoral process of the election days, there was a discussion whether the new people will be allowed into Duma or not, because the numbers for them were falling and the uh, countdown for their percentage stopped at 5.32. Uh, it stayed for at 5.33 for, for a while, but um, uh, people, no one was really sure, will they, uh, will they be allowed to stay or uh, the uh, makeup of four parties in the Duma will uh, stay the same. The fact that, that they were allowed to stay, uh, I think, does point out once again that this was a Kremlin's creature of sorts, that this was a party that um, very much was supported by the administrative resources and administrative support um, of the Russian government. Uh, so, um, uh, let me... Uh, take a look at some other observations I had. Um, um, the, the big issue that emerges, of course, how uh, the Kremlin was able to achieve these numbers uh, in the atmosphere that I have described that uh, the, um, the Kremlin's um, objectives were very much uh, coming constrained um, by uh, by the overall um, depressive mode, uh, by the overall sense of frustrations 
that uh, have grown over the past years uh, and by the intense work of uh, the political opposition associated with Navalny's group. How come the uh, Kremlin was able to achieve that? Um, this is also worth asking because early results, um, let me actually come back to you and stop sharing this screen. The early results of vote uh, were quite shocking to the Kremlin. Uh, the early results, results in Russia come from the Far East, and um, the numbers that uh, the Central Electoral Commission posted, um, the tables that they posted showed basically that uh, the um, voting for the United Russia and for communists was very much uh, alike, around 30% or so. Uh, so these were the early results that were coming and um, that um, what we saw uh, later on developing is that this um, parity very much changed with the numbers for the communists falling down and that percentage that they fall down, that was the United Russia that was gaining. And um, um, one big um, source of uh, um, discussion emerged with regard to the results in Moscow and that brought attention to the management and to how these results were achieved. Uh, I do need to share this other slide to demonstrate uh, the um, role of uh, a very important role for electronic voting in Moscow. Uh, so let me just give one second here. Um, When, uh, this is the uh, map of uh, voting in Moscow. This is sort of the representation of uh, Moscow districts. And what you see on this map, on the left, uh, the, you see green and uh, blue color representing a vote uh, for a smart vote candidate by green and uh, uh, the administrative candidate, United Russia candidate, uh, represented in blue and uh, the results of voting if we do not incorporate electronic voting in Moscow uh, and if we when we incorporate electronic voting uh, about two million people were registered for electronic voting in Moscow uh, and when we incorporate electronic voting in Moscow these are the results on the right in blue right so all those districts where the smart voting candidate was winning uh, when you accounted for voters who came to voting booths and who submitted a hard copy of their um, ballots, uh, all those districts changed the color after um, the electronic voting results uh, were accounted for. Now, um, the big questions emerged because uh, the results of electronic voting were actually um, not released immediately and uh, according to various accounts there was four times of counting the electronic results. A lot of jokes emerged that and I don't know if it was a joke or not that Ella Pamphilova mentioned that they needed to print out every electronic vote and then count it. So we saw um, a very unprecedented delay. Uh, the expectation was that the results of electronic voting should come out very quickly, uh, but the, the reality was vice versa. That raised, uh, of course, criticism on the part of observers that the electronic voting uh, was um, the key um, method, at least in Moscow, for um, changing the results in favor of the United Russia and in disfavor of the communists. Now, uh, whether, you know, it's very, of course, it's very hard to prove this, right? The electronic voting done through blockchain is a very non-transparent um, uh, methodology, a very non-transparent mechanism. Uh, in my reading of uh, commentary, 
the FSB was controlling and there was no really public control over what happens um, in the black box and um, the various theories and ideas about uh, how they were able to temper the results are there still in the discussion being debated by the observers. Um, now, why uh, the, the only important reason why we might ex that, you know, again, there, there is uncertainty, but it is also true that the administrative resources of Sabanian um, government were used to pressure loyalists to rely on electronic voting. So that must that must be suggested that among those two millions who signed up for electronic voting, um, there were many non-activist candidates. And on the other hand, the communist uh, candidates and uh, the smart voting candidates and voters actually who were associated with smart voting were really um, advocated not to use electronic voting. So from one perspective, there might be a selection of certain degree of selection bias in terms of who used electronic voting and who didn't. But at the same time, uh, observers do know that when you compare the difference, the differentiations between the uh, you know face to face voting and electronic voting, the 2020 results of the communist uh, of the constitutional amendments uh, voting that were also uh, uh, relied on electronic voting in part do not you do not reveal that divergence and in fact um, uh, I think the numbers there were 65 versus 62 with 65 percent support uh, in those districts that were that uh, in uh, in the non-electronic vote so the pro loyalist um, action was stronger in the non-electronic voting. So this is used by some again to make observations. Uh, how do we prove the uh, potential fraud? Can we see potential fraud? Another interesting observation that is made with regard to Moscow voting is um, that there is too big of a correspondence between the number of votes that are taken away from communists and that go into the United Russia and that the number of votes for all other parties stays the same. It's quite balanced in electronic and non-electronic voting. And we see this sort of um, uh, in Russia, that um, there is a very direct linkage between the votes for in smart voting situation, uh, smart voting candidates and the United Russia candidates. So we still are in the process of trying to understand and trying to um, figure out really the um, uh, the role of electronic voting and whether the fraud could be proven or not. I think um, uh, um, whether it could be proven or not with a high degree of certainty, uh, the, uh, as one observer, Boris Savchinikov, I followed uh, mentioned, the fact that people were uh, strongly coerced or mobilized to sign up for it, that there, there, were no, there was no public um, control over how what happens in the black box. There was no confirmation. Uh, all these just um, very um, oblique, non-transparent processes surrounding electronic voting worked to really discredit um, the, uh, that, that element of elections uh, overall. Although, as noted by others, from the Kremlin's perspective, from the uh, presidential administration's perspective, this is one case, uh, one methodology, one mechanism of managing, potentially managing the votes that does not include potential proof of when we talk about carousel voting, there, there could be photographs, there could be YouTube videos, and things that could be used by the opposition to bring to the public to show with the electronic voting, the systems, the technocratic nature and the black box nature of the processes associated with electronic voting make it um, not quite open for being used by the political opposition, except for the opinions voiced. But the proof is hard to come while in face to face voting, the proof is easier to come because there are observers and um, etc. Um, so uh, I think hopefully we'll have a good uh, Q&A session. Um, uh, I think I sort of shared with some of the key observations. Uh, the irregularities, of course, are not um, 
limited to Moscow voting. When we look at the turnout and the results uh, of voting for United Russia uh, across the Russian regions, many of the same patterns uh, that were observed in previous elections where we had ethnic republics and the republics in the Caucasus, but also Tatarstan and Bashkortostan, uh, where administrative apparatus works to mobilize voters to a much greater extent than in other regions where turnout is again managed and brought up with along with the vote for the party of power. All those observations hold same for these elections as well. Um, let me share the slides about um, a regional gubernatorial election. Um, just one second. And that would be my last um, point to discuss before the questions. So, uh, hold on, I think I need to shift it first. So let me just run. One second. No, that's not good. Here. All right. So um, I hope you see the um, just the list of regions where uh, gubernatorial elections were held. Uh, there were nine regions where there were elections of governors, regional executive, and the two uh, regions where um, rather than um, people electing, it's this, their uh, regional legislators vote on the, their um, chief executive. So the last two, Karachev, Cherkesi and North Ossetia are those cases. Uh, now, with regard to all the regional executive elections, we see victories for uh, the candidates who were already uh, playing the role of uh, regional chief executives. So they were going for re-elections or for reaffirming their positions from the acting gubernatorial positions. And in majority of cases, but two really, we see very high numbers uh, of victories. So in Tula, 84% um, uh, vote for the uh, current governor Dumin. In Belgorod, uh, 79%. Pienza, 72 you look Mordovia, uh, Mordov Republic is doing off 178%, Ulyanovsk 83%. Now, with regards to Tiva and Chechnya, 86, almost 87%, and in Chechnya, Kadyrov getting 99.7%, those are expected cases. But just putting Chechnya and Tiva side by side with Tula, Belgorod, Pienza, Mordovia, um, tells us, and Ulyanovsk with 83%, which is unprecedented um, support for the regional executive. Um, one observation that could be made is that there is, yeah, sometimes there is a term Chechenization that is used, right? But all of Russia turning into or, or adopting patterns, electoral patterns that have been characteristic of um, the ethnic republics where uh, the mobilization turnout and the pro-establishment, pro-gubernatorial vote is usually very, very high. So we see that uh, that hasn't been the case in many Russian regions, but with Pienza, Belgorod, Moldova, well, Moldova is not a Russian, but um, uh, Tula is, um, uh, we see this interesting trend developing, which I think on the one hand shows a strong support of the Kremlin and a certain degree of uh, lack of accountability that um, uh, regional governors um, feel uh, uh, that allows them to um, max to rely on their administrative resource to um, uh, to deliver the support for the regional executive. So if in the earlier times we saw regional governors uh, being a bit humble with the numbers and not allowing those numbers of voting for themselves to go beyond, say, the support level for Putin, that limit right now seems to be gone. And um, they are really um, <laughs> trying to get as much support as they can. So, uh, which does, which is an interesting signal that um, 
uh, that that uh, they have uh, received. And uh, if in Soviet times uh, the vote for regional executives, um, the vote you know the vote that during the Soviet elections. Um, Soviet officials were able to receive was frequently used to measure the mobilizational capacity and the administrative capacity of these officials. It looks like that that signaling element of how much they get to signal their administrative capacity is back in play today. So that would be my interpretation. So for the normal, uh, more regular numbers of support, we only see Tver with 52% uh, 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 vote for the um, governor. And an interesting case of Khabarovsk with Mikhail Dikterov, uh, very, uh, in, you know, many observers were glued to see whether Dikterov uh, will be able to um, get electoral support. And also we see more or less normal numbers there with around 57%. Um, uh, Habarovs is interesting because of uh, very um, uh, of the protests um, uh, after Sergei Furgal's removal um, in uh, uh, 2020, and so uh, a bit more than a year ago, um, Habarovsk um, uh, voters were very unhappy with uh, their LDPR candidate being removed from power and imprisoned, and uh, Kremlin sending Mikhail Dikterov in his stead. So he wasn't for many months, he was not really um, accepted, but we do see that he was able to organize uh, some degree of support for himself. At the same time, I should note that Khabarovsk stands out among other regions with the very low turnout figures today, which I think is uh, a sense of um, just uh, apathy and um, disbelief in uh, the fact that voting matters, uh, which does reflect the situation after Sergei Furgal's uh, removal from, uh, from power. Um, so these are, I guess, um, the key observations that I wanted to share with, um, with regard to the regional legislative elections, uh, we see uh, again a pattern of voting uh, for United Russia um, and uh, the regional administrations working towards maintaining support for United Russia. Some regions uh, stand out in the uh, percentage of the regional legislators that is made up of made up of United Russia, specifically, uh, you know, places. Um, uh, just give me a second um, uh, to share the numbers. Uh, in most cases, we had uh, under 30 percent, but uh, just to mention few uh, legislators in Sverdlovsk with turnout 46 percent, you are uh, United Russia won 36 percent in Perm around 34 percent, a very high numbers in Kaluga with 86 percent of their legislator, uh, rather high in Magadan 56. Uh, Kurgan and Rezan around 45-46%, Kastrama around 30%. So uh, United Russia uh, is winning in all of these regions, but the makeup uh, and the proportion of other parties, LDPR, KPRF uh, and Novi Ludi, uh, I think we'll have to check again, but in St. Petersburg, the legislator uh, might be a number two position with around 12% or so. So there are some um, interesting results that I think are worth of uh, looking over much more carefully than I have been able to do it over these past um, few days. So thank you for your attention. I look forward to, um, uh, to your questions. Thank you very much, uh, Grunos, for a very uh, thorough and, and interesting and nuanced presentation of, of, of um, both the process leading up to the elections and, and the results. Uh, we have got quite a few um, questions already, and I'll try to group them together, but please uh, uh, let them keep coming. And I thought we'll start with some questions about the smart voting process. Uh, first of all, uh, Per Christian Ola, uh, our uh, Often Posten's correspondent, uh, Norwegian Daily's correspondent in in Moscow, he asked if you can share the, the map of of the 
the um, smart voting in Moscow. I, I don't know if you could do that in in the chat, chat Gulnas. But um, uh, a couple of questions related to the smart voting. Uh, first of all, beyond Moscow, we, we saw from your map that with the electronic voting votes coming in, uh, uh, all uh, the candidates uh, listed in the smart uh, voting list uh, failed. But what is the situation elsewhere? Uh, did smart voting work in, in other parts, uh, in other uh, single seat constituencies? And we have one question here from Daniela Sabinski, taking into consideration how the regime handled the results from smart voting. Would you say that people have lost confidence in it now? Is it a dead project? Or is there a future for, for this kind of pooling of, of uh, votes to, to challenge the powers that be? Yeah, that's a very good question because that's the most practical political question today, right? Uh, did smart voting uh, work? And is there any alternative strategy? Now, let me first start with this Russian saying, which I was thinking yesterday, trying to translate it into English. Uh, Helge, help me. Uh, I don't think there will be a very one-to-one -one translation, but we can come up with a metaphor that captures it. There is um, one, uh, so saying is против лома нет приема, which means you can't conquer over a rock. Of, I mean, if I can put a metaphor into it, a bit different metaphor. So when we speak about the type of falsification uh, that, that, for example, if there was in fact tampering with the electronic results, where using whatever formula, again, there were various suggestions as to like maybe the, the vote for United Russia was counted for two, <laughs> um, you know, and then people said, well, it's possible because the ends and means and the ins and outs have to come out because there is a certain number of candidates uh, or whether the, you know, people who were pressured to sign up for electoral voting uh, um, might have and their logins might have been somehow obtained by the authorities and used because, um, you know, uh, um, or there were people who were forcefully assigned for electoral voting because people who sometimes there were cases, real cases, I haven't heard too many, but definitely single and maybe single digits. There were cases that would come to vote to the you know booths to the stations and they would be given information that they're actually signed up for an electoral vote and they didn't know about it. So there are these irregularities. Now, if uh, there is, and we shouldn't be very conspiratorial, but we don't know, uh, if there is um, someone who is tampering with results, then, um, you know, smart voting and collective coordination of voters uh, in support of non party of power candidates is uh, doomed to fail just because it's, you know, it's um, um, facing a rock situation that it cannot overpower. Uh, does that mean that smart voting doesn't work? Um, I think uh, earlier observations and observations from this elections actually do suggest that smart voting actually does work um, because the um, the blatant manipulation of the sort that could happen in the black box of electronic voting is not has not been common. It could be adopted across Russia, and I think the situation might be leaving, leading towards that situation where elect electoral voting would be adopted more and more by other um, uh, regions as well. And in that case, again, um, uh, uh, smart voting might not, work, might not work. But today, when we talk about non-electoral voting, the smart voting uh, technique appears to be really the only uh, remaining strategy for coordinating voting. And if there is one um, big achievement of Navalny, his group and political opposition, it's the fact that um, you know, they were able to uh, uh, organize, you know, to calculate uh, who that number one candidate is. They do agree that they don't always 
get get it right, but they put their resources to actually creating that list and communicating and distributing, putting it out through various media venues, through applications on smartphones, through I don't know, Wikipedia, through Google Docs, through all kinds of means, and then through the activists themselves who are uh, capable and willing to help other voters to find who that candidate is. And there is a strong, big mobilization. Uh, I mean, um, so, so, so um, in the absence of electronic voting, uh, I do not see uh, any other alternative for collective mobilization and the smart voting um, mechanism and the work of the team in creating a list of candidates across all the uh, thousands of districts uh, has been an amazing achievement and work of uh, activists to, to, to create that list and to coordinate voting at such a scale. And this is one of those uh, also amazing things about um, uh, political opposition and Navalny's work that he um, forced Kremlin's reaction and uh, a very fearful reaction with regard to smart voting and with regard to discontinuing any, any of those venues like the Apple and Google and the applications that were allowed through Android and Apple phones. Uh, I mean, the government, the Russian government had to um, deny and had to come to agreements with these big um, um, companies to um, fight against smart voting. And this is done by, you know, by, by the team, the uh, leader of which uh, sits in, in prison and thereby affecting the Russian politics to such an extent. It's um, quite an, you know, quite a, it's a huge achievement. So, uh, uh, although, you know, I did focus on Moscow, but um, smart voting has worked elsewhere. And um, in St. Petersburg, for example, um, uh, among other uh, political technologies like non-electronic, uh, a very big case that was discussed for a long time was a candid uh, candidate uh, Boris Vishnevsky, right? And you saw the clone candidates and um, uh, uh, the, the main guy from Yablika was a member of smart voting uh, list and, and uh, he won in the end. And despite these other technologies of cloning the candidate and other people getting his name and growing beards and stuff, in the end, it didn't work. Uh, St. Petersburg voters um, emerged as um, uh, smarter than than those technologies, I guess. <laughs> yeah, so, so maybe also also this uh, stunt with the double uh, uh, double gangers uh, ended up actually creating publicity and helping Vishnevsky uh, rather than. Uh, detracting support. But we should stay with the electronic voting because there are uh, several questions about that. Um, there was an article in Medusa with a with the title Electronic Voting Must Die. It was an interview with uh, Sergei Spilkin and Pekistan Ola asks here, what is your opinion about the analysis that has been done by Sergei Spilkin about the Duma elections? Could you comment on that? And just a second, I'll scroll down because it was also another. Let me see if I, yeah, uh, another question re referring to Spilkin. Um, could you elaborate on the former strategies used to produce the correct results, correct in inverted commas? Were these put into effect this year too? Uh, uh, that is Spilkin's investigations into ballot stuffing and fake voters. Yeah. So, so both, if you could come, come say a little bit more about the prospects of electronic voting, but also the, the traditional uh, uh, mechanisms for, for falsifying the results. Yeah. So let me first um, talk a little bit about the electronic voting. And the whole technological turn um, that uh, seems to be underway uh, in the Russian uh, governance sphere. And then I'll definitely talk about Sergei Spirkin. I saw the graphs that he produced um, actually just, just this morning. So um, um, we can discuss that. Uh, I can maybe even pull it out, but um, 
I'm afraid of also losing time. So with regard to um, electronic voting, on the one hand, um, you know, Sabianian uh, has uh, um, has really put a lot of um, effort into uh, his smart city agenda. And uh, much of this um, uh, attempt actually worked out in his favor. Now, with regard and and the efforts of um, building a smart city where everyone is connected through all kinds of applications, most water through, uh, you know, I did my I myself did a work on uh, Russian po or Moscow potholes and how people and what the electoral effects of um, uh, reporting and fixing those potholes is. And this works not only with roads, it works with apartments, with housing issues, with billboards, with um, parks, with, um, uh, but the point is that each citizen is somehow connected and has a say, and there is this active citizen portal where uh, Moscovites are invited to vote on the names of like subway stations, usually unimportant um, things like that. Uh, but still, you know, if you want to have an ownership over how uh, your neighborhood subway station is called and, you know, you, you, you participate, uh, you are an active citizen. Now, these methods of governance uh, are actually being spread um, uh, across country, uh, you know, Moscow. Oblast, St. Petersburg, uh, other uh, richer cities like Kazan, but also other regions as well. So the trend towards this technocratic uh, governance that relies on digital sphere um, has been there for a number of years and I do not see it stopping. I think it's going to continue and I think the authorities will um, learn from um, from from these elections um, um, and uh, will be spreading those new technologies across the country. So that would be my, uh, uh, you know, uh, my, my conclusion on uh, uh, what will happen under this regime. Now, uh, electronic voting could be done more transparently and more under the control of some public organizations. So, um, uh, whether electronic voting will die entirely or new accountability mechanisms will be put in place. That is, that is a big question, right? Under which condition, under which leadership, under which authorities new account accountability mechanisms could and should be put in place is probably the more important question than just um, saying that uh, electronic voting doesn't have um, any uh, right for existence. So I think there will be, you know, uh, as with books and electronic books, you know, some people like only reading books and others have shifted. I think it's hard to stop pro progress from that perspective, but there will be, of course, debates. Um, but from the Russian perspective, these trends have accumulated a lot of steam and are very much in the process of um, growth, expansion and distribution. Now, with regard to Sergei Shpilkin, um, uh, over the past two days, I've been observing a lot of um, graphs with uh, some, some of them are called Kameta, the comet, when uh, the, the distribution of votes uh, on the plane is shown that there is a core of voters and it's usually, the, uh, and, you know, usually these graphs concern the uh, uh, relationship between the turnout and the vote for United Russia. United Russia vote is on the upper on the uh, vertical and the turnout is on the horizontal plane and you have the distribution this is a cloud with the center uh, on the point around 30 percent around 30 percent 30 40 turnout and around 30 percent um, vote for united russia is where the core of the cloud is and then there is a dispersive uh, tail that's why it's a comet and this dispersive tail goes to the upper right corner which indicates that the uh, percentage of votes for United Russia grows with the increasing turnout. And um, now these, um, these um, uh, uh, representations then point out that 
in normal situation, um, many observers expect that the turnout should not be linked up with the preference for a specific party. And if we see an increase in turnout associated with the growth of numbers for one party among there were 14 parties that run in the election, um, then there are irregularities linked to that. So, so the observation that there is a core which represents real votes and there is this tail which represents some sort of irregularity is based on that expectation that, you know, you know, if 30% of people come out to vote and there is a certain spread of preferences. And if 90% of people come out to vote and there is a certain spread of preferences, right? That the spread of preferences should not be dependent on how many people vote. That's the expectation that if we believe in that expectation, then these graphs represent where the normal, quote unquote, potentially normal or the regular vote is and where the tampered vote is. How that tampering is done, whether there is, you know, a forced mobilization on the workplace. I didn't talk about it, but it's a good chance to talk. These elections, uh, I think, stood out in terms of a rather intense um, uh, forced mobilization on the workplace. Not a new phenomenon in Russia, but it really stood out this time concerning many more people than usually it's done. So in Moscow I talked about, but usually this happens like in places like Tatarstan and Bashkortostan and where you have big um, uh, uh, enterprises where uh, which are very much uh, connected to, to the authorities and where enterprise mobilization happens. Um, very commonly, but these strategies have been adopted across um, uh, Russia as well. But back to Spielken. So um, Spielken built um, um, uh, a graph that shows the normal distribution of votes, which is around, I think he mentioned about 33% uh, for United Russia and uh, just a bit less for communists, right? So using this expectation that I told you about, there is an then analysis of where that normal distribution is and how it works um, uh, for United Russia and what does it do for for the communists. So, uh, uh, so I think that those are the numbers that uh, that came up from his analysis that there is this norm that potentially untampered vote around 30, 33 percent for United Russia, not 50 percent as we get in the end, and then there is this tail. And in the tail, <laughs> very interesting, there was a sort of increasing vote for United Russia. And there is this very high peak for United Russia that he shows. And he, he suggests that this is the electronic vote, uh, electronic voting, which, which, which is quite unusually stands out uh, on that graph. And once again, bringing attention to a uh, high likelihood of uh, tampering with the electronic voting in Moscow. It's, it really stands out on his vote. So Sergei Spilkin is um, a, a very well respected um, quantitative analyst who has been at the forefront of revealing through statistical means the amount of fraud uh, in Russian elections. And um, if there is someone to trust in analysis, I guess uh, he will be the person. So from that perspective, I um, you know, I, I haven't checked exactly what he does, but I've tried to relate to you uh, both the reputation that his analysis has and what it shows for the for these last elections. Very good. Uh, we will then um, we will then uh, take a few questions about parties uh, uh, and, and the parties that are represented in the State Duma. First of all, it was a question from our good colleague at the Finnish Institute of International Affairs, Jussi Lossila, uh, who writes, what are now after blatant vote manipulation, uh, the Communist Party's prospects to become a genuine opposition party? And we have so, a very similar question here. Also, if it would be the Communist from now on will become less of a systemic opposition and more genuine opposition. 
and therefore might become a real challenge in the Duma in the future? Yeah, very good, very important questions. Uh, and there is no very simple answer. So I'll point out the divergent forces working uh, in this um, situation. Number one, when we talk about the leadership, right, uh, Zuganov, um, who has been by now, I think, um, yeah, there is a consensus that uh, Zuganov um, works along the Kremlin and that there are clear um, um, agreements uh, in terms of uh, the Communist Party supporting when it's needed, um, United Russia, the Party of Power, the Kremlin. Um, so this is to say that under this leadership, um, a big shift in the role of Communist Party moving from a systemic opposition to an anti-systemic opposition or out of the system opposition, I think is not likely. So, so let me start with the leadership. Uh, now, the second point is that um, we also, interestingly, we observe it with um, the activists working for Navalny. Uh, the, the fact is that uh, whether we look at communists or at Navalny's camp, uh, their success in spreading influence across Russia is also associated with um, the diversity of political interests, organizations, um, agendas, individuals uh, across the country. And I think just like with the Navalny team, we also see that with the communists as well. Uh, uh, I haven't, you know, empirically studied uh, uh, recent developments with communist Party, so I am just giving you my impression from different types of media sources that uh, I've encountered. And my understanding is that it is the Communist Party that has been going through a lot of rejuvenation in the regions uh, over the past months and years. And so despite the fact, so, so the party is held together by the same leader who calls the shot. But at the same time, the capacity for uh, the new leadership to come up and make different decisions and potentially um, building on this demand uh, and the support, the protest vote that they have received and the, de the demand uh, uh, for them, uh, it might, um, uh, there, there could be, so there are evolutionary changes that might lead to specific bigger shifts, wouldn't call it revolution, but we're talking about the party development, right? So under the same leadership, I don't think um, anything systemic would happen in terms of the changing role of the Communist Party right now, but there seems to be new trends and new people and new ideas and divergence uh, and dissimilarity evolving and developing within the Communist Party that creates that potential for renewal under a new leadership. So, um, but at the same time, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, when, although we talk about um, uh, you know, communists being the protest vote and opposition, but the diversity of opinions and, you know, why liberals were so unwilling sometimes to vote for communists because there you have extremely um, hardline rightist forces, conservatives, pro-Stalinist sort of, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, political opposition is not always pretty and liberal from the, from the Western perspective, speaking about that. But so um, so uh, the, the outcomes and the direction in which the Communist Party would, would go uh, might not be as expected, um, you know, from the more liberal perspective. So it might not be very pretty either. Could you also briefly uh, comment on uh, Grudinin and uh, the fact that he was uh, taken off the ballot? Yes, so that's that's the exactly the issue of leadership staying the same, Zuganov calling the shot and um, Grudinian who ran in 2018 elections um, unexpectedly again brought a lot of um, protest vote around him and um, turned into the unexpected leader, unexpected um, person who drew support around him and he was a known figure by now, right? So I think there was just um, 
a fear from the Communist Party that they will get an uncontrollable situation of Grudinian drawing too much support and the Communist Party not being able to deliver on its agreements with the Kremlin. Mm -hmm. We also have uh, a question here about the, the newcomer, the, the new people, mm -hmm. uh, Nobil Yude, and is uh, new people a, a genuine uh, liberal party? Is it a spoiler uh, question here? What sentiments, attitudes was new people trying to tap into during the election? Uh, taking the current political, social and economic situation in Russia into consideration. So who, who votes for new, uh, new people and uh, wh what kind of animal is this? Yeah, so new people do draw on the protest vote. So uh, people who don't have chance to like vote against all this. Uh, it is a spoiler party. Um, it was given as an opportunity uh, for something different. Um, for you know, a new face, uh, new faces of sorts. Um, the the only two two people associated, the big people associated with the party that I'm familiar with, uh, and more actually with the number two, Sardana Asksentieva, um, who was um, a very popular mayor in Yakutsk, um, who made her name on rather populist stands, uh, and um, she. Um, she, she she reduced the salaries for like um, uh, officials at the administration. So things that people do like, you know, like people who don't like state officials and they think that there is too big of a bureaucracy and they're paid too much money. So she sort of catered to those populist um, ideas uh, from from her perspective. Um, she didn't stay a mayor for too long. I think uh, she stepped out uh, after two years of being a mayor, but she already around 2018-19, she drew a lot of attention from the public and even from the Western observers as, you know, a new type of politician, a new person uh, not connected to the establishment. And I think um, the builders of this new party, uh, you know, wanted to bring such people who on the one hand have already been in public and drew some support but on the other hand are perceived as new types of politics new type of politician politicians uh, but i didn't see any um, systemic systematic regular type of ideology behind the party so i do um, it was positioned as uh, more liberal uh, but um, uh, and and i do view it as a spoiler party to get the niche that um, Yabloka uh, doesn't, uh, to get that that liberal niche in the Duma that, uh, that exactly is for yeah. Uh, then during your presentation, you talked about politics of fear and of intimidation uh, uh, and and harassment of uh, activists, and I, I guess we also should include journalists there and we. We have one question uh, from my colleague uh, Julia Willemsen here at NUPE. How has the critical oppositional press, such as Nove Gazeta, covered elections? What is the effect of recent wave of repression, including against independent journalists, on the coverage and the editor editorial line of independent media outlets? Uh, I'm getting into Nova Gazeta. <laughs> Well, we, I think we could also uh, look at this, uh, the, the broader issue here of, of uh, how uh, the campaign was covered and to the extent it was covered. If you could also add on something to that, because to me, this seemed like a campaign with very little focus on political issues. And, and very uh, low temperature. So, so if you also could add on that, yeah. please. Yeah, yeah. In the big cities, um, many people have observed that um, there is an attempt to actually uh, lower turnout because the information about um, the candidates was not readily available. And uh, <laughs> Elena Panfilova, uh, who lives in Moscow and is at the center of this very big um, network, was writing how, how um, the information frequently is um, 
put up in very small streets and Piriulki and like side streets and you don't see signs of complaining very much uh, in the bigger cities. Uh, so from the publicity perspective, I think um, that's one of the observations that could be made and a lot of, but that also brings our attention to the fact that uh, a lot of responsibility for the election was, um, you know, uh, outsourced to um, not just the workplace, workplaces. So mobilization at the workplace is turning into quite a key uh, governance mechanism in Russia. I actually link it up also to the pandemic and like issues like vaccination and um, we do uh, face a situation of uh, mandatory vaccination in many of the workplaces in Russia through workplace done, right? So when the regional governors uh, in a way outsource um, the, 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 uh, the goals, the objectives of the percentage of people to be vaccinated to the workplace. And so I think um, <laughs> in a, yeah, this is actually a new idea I haven't, I haven't read, but I wonder to an ex the extent to which the experience with the pandemic and the management of, um, you know, uh, governance issues with regards to pandemic might have shifted to a certain extent the dynamic of relationship between how individuals face authorities and how the workplace becomes even more important um, um, agent of uh, interaction linking people to authorities. So uh, I think uh, uh, that's why when we talk about uh, sort of very intense mobilization at the workplace today, uh, this might be taking its um, uh, origin from the interactions that we saw over the past months over other issues as well. So, you know, this is to say that the political goals and political processes are moved from the public space into uh, other um, uh, realms, uh, also public, but say work, uh, work realms. But uh, I'm sorry with regard to the Nova Gazeta issue. Um, I wouldn't be able uh, just out of uh, the, the, the back of my head to uh, give um, specific um, observations with regard to the pattern of coverage of elections in Nova Gazeta. Uh, although I do uh, always uh, find some interesting things to read there, but I, uh, I don't think I've done a study that would allow me to um, I mean, like issues like Vishnevsky, there are some things that were covered very well, Medus and Nova Gazeta and things, but uh, it didn't, definitely didn't go, um, uh, you know, into a very broad, um, like regional or, or in, in, in inter-regional coverage of election, but more of those bigger cases uh, that were discussed in various uh, presses um, and, you know, captured by various sources. Uh, we still have a uh, few minutes to go and we have uh, still a, a number of questions. If there are more, please keep sending them, but we'll now turn to um, to uh, the potential impact of what took place in Belarus uh, last year. Uh, it's a question from our colleague Karn Anna Egen. Uh, could you also link some of Krem's pre-election strategies to the post-election demonstrations in Belarus? To what extent can we expect similar advancements towards Russia's opposition in the 2024 presidential elections? And how may we expect the declining social political outlook to shape this outcome? And then maybe we should use the opportunity to also use to, to, to use the seminar to do some uh, PR for a good book that came out uh, last year on Oxford University Press. We were supposed, Gunnar was supposed to come here to have give a physical presentation and also to give a book presentation of The Red Mirror, uh, her new book, which um, inquires into Putin's leadership strategy. So maybe you also can uh, share some of the insights from that when you're talking about uh, what next from here and up to 2024 and how how that uh, might play out. Thank you. Thank you for uh, mentioning the book. Um, 
I'll, I'll come back to that issue. I, I actually have some good news about the book too, which I will not disclose, but um, just suggest that read it because um, it has certain recognitions that go just beyond what Helge or I tell you. Um, so, but with regards to the Belarus, actually, that's a very good, um, very good question. And um, I was planning to talk a little bit about it in uh, when I discussed the run up to the elections. And I think, um, you know, uh, the regimes are very similar and are becoming more and more similar with uh, as uh, the repressive um, mood, mood and, and practices in the Russian um, space uh, uh, as, as they have been increasing. But um, how have the Belarusian events been taken into account um, in Russia? And I think um, the, uh, you know, the trying to avoid the blatancy of um, the divergence in electoral results uh, as occurred in Belarus, you know, with um, one, one candidate unexpectedly uh, capturing uh, uh, you know, attention of uh, a big opposition to the Belarusian leader and uh, Lukashenko himself coming up with very big numbers, right? Like 86 or 82 percent for uh, for him, um, and that that, um, that 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 sheer difference in representing the overwhelming support for his personality, for his candidate candidature, and um, a very low support for his opponent. Uh, the blatancy of that divergence uh, seemed to have enraged and brought people uh, out. And therefore, I think uh, if um, the Kremlin had to take any um, lessons from that is um, <laughs> to be a bit uh, softer in managing the figures. And while in some places like in Chechnya, uh, we see, uh, you know, crazy numbers um, of 99.7. Uh, I hope I'm not um, brought to um, action for, brought to uh, a situation of apologizing for saying that it, it's crazy. Um, but that's that's the politics uh, of fear in Russia for you, right? Um, whenever someone says something uh, unexpected by, um, by Kadyrov, and very frequently they are forced to apologize for a lot of threats and things like that. So uh, therefore, the numbers that we see uh, with the United Russia, right, with um, 49 point something percent um, are um, just there, just, um, uh, you know, uh, there, there seems to be to have been set a threshold by, by Kirienka, you know, to around 50 percent. And um, it's not uh, crazy 80, 90 percent, but um, uh, so, so, so there is, um, a sense of a measured approach of um, uh, how it all looks from outside. So uh, that's that's one thing. Um, and uh, the other important thing, and I started also talking about, uh, I, I talked a lot about the social issues uh, and um, a very intentional attention given by the Kremlin to the social issues through um, support for families and all kinds of programs that exist and um, that, uh, you know, like the drops of money that comes into many families, um, um, unavoidably it is associated with the establishment, it is associated with the powers that are uh, with Putin uh, and um, <clears throat> brings some degree of um, um, complacency that, um, you know, it could be still worse than we have it now and uh, the government is thinking about us and is trying to support us and uh, I think that, um, you know, it is paying off uh, type strategy um, uh, and, um, you know, I think uh, there is an understand. Oh, I mean, Lukashenko has been able to mostly rely on fear and repression, but I think the lesson for Putin is that um, the Kremlin doesn't quite want to go entirely that way, that the, there is a surgical action against specific individuals, right? The fear and repression specifically against those who, you know, um, reveal and openly um, 
oppose uh, authorities. Uh, but there is also this other strategy of uh, approaching um, you know, millions of people through um, talk about the government paying attention to the rise of prices and the government and Putin really putting his efforts into having agreements with retailers about maintaining prices on specific food items. And that is what is being publicized. That is what, I mean, here in the West, we see different publicity, right? We see publicity around Lubov Sobol left Russia, Gutkov went there, Dishnevsky cloning. So the media environment that we live in is quite different from the media environment that many Russians find themselves, unless they are already identifying with the opposition. Uh, and so um, there is a lot of um, uh, the social agenda that's 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 part of the media environment for Russians. And I think this uh, social agenda uh, and the attempt by the government to cater to the social needs is one thing that um, um, that, that could be seen as part partly learned from the Belarus um, situation. Uh, I do not think that the Kremlin wants to uh, come to the situation of very uh, extensive, large-scale protests um, uh, and is using not only fear mechanisms, but other mechanisms as well. Um, yeah, yeah. I don't know how to connect this to, to the book situation, but it's okay. <laughs> we are talking about the elections. But yes, the book, I'll, I'll, I guess I'll mention, just to give me a couple of seconds. Um, I, uh, my book, The Red Mirror, uh, Putin's Leadership and Russia's Insecure Identity, was a very personal quest, um, trying to answer a question uh, of how and why the Russian society after Crimea views politics in Russia and Putin's leadership through such a different lens than how people in the West view. You know, as this, the Russia surrounding was getting more and more um, worried about authoritarianism, about aggression, about this and that uh, related to Russia. Uh, in Russia, uh, you know, uh, the, at least the, the highlight point of July, August 2014, um, record sense of well-being uh, among the Russian population for 25 years. Record sense of well-being, optimism, etc. And I was trying to understand uh, how, how, how is that? Uh, you know, how do we make sense of it? And um, I'm, I'm a political economy person who have studied Russian regions and institutions and, and economies. But to answer this question, I needed to go to social uh, psychology and I found an answer in social identity theory, which allowed me, and in fact, not just social identity theory, but the, the theory of leadership relying on social identity theory, which brought together um, and it allowed me to bring together the Soviet past, the Soviet cognitive collective identity patterns with the 1990s that were built into a collective trauma by the media and through cultural sphere and through the socio-political sphere and um, how the uh, what we got from the Soviet uh, collective identity with the experience of the 1990s well, that was turned into collective trauma, how that built up uh, the Kremlin and specifically leadership of Vladimir Putin into sort of a savior of Russia uh, and how the, the Crimea annexation really solidified that, that symbolic role of leader uh, in Russia. And um, I do say that um, the, the book is very much um, uh, focused on this post-Crimea euphoria and that moment has been dissipating and yet when we, whenever we talk with leaders and about leaders, uh, thank you so much, Osman, for bringing that up. Or maybe help me, <laughs> thank you. Uh, but um, when we talk about the symbols, right? Symbols don't, political situation changes, but symbols don't change very quickly. And there is an inertia associated with the role that Putin has acquired through, through those years. And I think he, there is still a bit of inertia, uh, absolutely, associated with his 
person and how people perceive him and his achievements. And these achievements, of course, are linked to the foreign policy achievements and the role of Russia in the world, not domestic achievements. But nonetheless, uh, as I discovered in my studies, Russians do not really uh, link up the domestic to the foreign. They see this as different spheres. And it's, in fact, there is a compensatory effect at the individual level that for people who are even worse off today, domestically speaking, I mean, in their social economic lives, for them, the foreign uh, aspect of Russia's greatness might compensate for their wounded self-esteem in their contemporary, like just everyday life. So um, I think those uh, social identity theory and the psychological approach helped me to make sense of what happened uh, after Crimea and why Putin's leadership has gone on to the levels that it has gone. But Helge, thank you so much for um, for allowing me to talk about it. It was a very heartfelt uh, book uh, and the writing therefore there is quite, I think, approachable. So uh, if you're interested, please yeah, do read. You're going to enjoy it. So this was a small teaser and and you will see a link to the web page uh, posted in in the, the Q&A. So um, highly recommended. There are still uh, a few questions here that we didn't manage to get to about uh, uh, electoral interference, about blocking uh, the smart voting app, etc. I'm sorry that we didn't have time to, to get to that, but we are unfortunately running out of time. Just two quick announcements from my side. On the 29th of October, we will have NUPI's annual Russia conference. Uh, it will be a hybrid event. Um, so we hope to get uh, some of you uh, actually physically in the audience uh, at the House of Literature on the 29th, and we, but we will also uh, stream the event as usual. So you are very welcome to sign up uh, for that. And I said initially, this is a seminar series, meaning that we will have uh, a number of seminars over the coming years. We, start, we started off in the spring and we'll have uh, seminars normally once a semester talking about different aspects of uh, legitimation and legitimacy in, in, in a Russian political context. And uh, the next one out will be actually on uh, 11th of November when Andrei Makarichev, also part of our team, will come to Oslo for a physical event, uh, knock on wood, uh, uh, to talk about uh, uh, the handling of the pandemic. But for now, I would just like to uh, thank Gulnas for allowing us to, to pick her brain and and for being patient with us and, and answering our questions. We hope to see you here also in Oslo physically in the not too distant future. But as for now, please uh, join me in a, a virtual applaud for Gulnas. Thank you so much, Gulnas. Thank you. Thank you, Helge, for inviting. And my apologies, I tried to look for how to send that map or that little representation of Moscow, but I wasn't able to find the, the, the where in the chat I can just uh, copy and paste it. But um, for those who are interested, uh, there were several um, sort of big media person like Konstantin Sonin had it on his Facebook page and there were a few other places that um, that that map did appear and was actively discussed among Russia observers. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you.